I think it's really important um, for women to share um, their birth stories. Um, there's so many different, so many different stories and so many things that can happen. When I found out I was pregnant with my daughter, I was in the military at the time and getting ready to get out. I got back home. I knew I was gonna be a single mama. Um, started going to my doctor's appointments and I was very surprised at how differently I got treated. Um, it was more of, oh, are you by yourself? And, yes, ma'am, I'm by myself. Well. Is the dad in the picture? Like, these were very personal questions that I kind of felt like, I felt very judged. Um, being a black woman, and I'm single, we all know what the statistics say. They just saw another pregnant young black woman coming in here with no support. The, the stigma, the stigma, not knowing that, well, I'm a veteran, I'm insured, I have money coming in, the truth of the matter is, it's very difficult to navigate through those systems. The systems are not designed to be easy to access, and they create all kinds of barriers often uh, that people find very difficult to navigate through, and so they end up just giving up. I was sick. I mean, very, very sick. Um, even before I took the pregnancy test, I was sick. It seemed like all the information I could find was designed to reassure me. Even the first time I went into the emergency room, the doctor there was just like, oh, don't worry, it's gonna be fine. Women always worry about stuff like that, you know. And nobody really saw me because all that anybody saw was my belly, when I had a belly, you know, as, I mean, people would, you know, they put their hands on you, or, you know, like they wanna, you know, everything is baby, 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 and it's like you disappear. I was treated very coldly um, during my visits. I noticed I was getting vaginal exams when now, looking back, I should not have been getting vaginal exams. Um, one particular visit, I did have a situation where I was being examined and I felt a pinch and it kind of like a little pop. And she was like, oh, I'm so sorry, I poked you. And I was like, okay, it's okay. And Went on with the visit as normal, like everything was fine. A couple of days later, I noticed I started leaking fluid. So I go back in and they do, it's a nitrazine test. And sure enough, there was amniotic fluid in my canal. At the time, I was four months pregnant with her. And so I'm asking them, okay, what does this mean? Well, we're just gonna monitor it and just see, see how it goes. Every time I went back for those visits, the ultrasound visits, the fluid was just lower and lower every time I went back. And I couldn't even, that was just such a grim feeling to like, I'm, I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm clearly leaking, like, can you do something? Can you do something? Like my daughter is, she's going to suffocate. Well, no, I, there's nothing that we can do. We're just going to have to keep watching. And once you hit viability, we'll send you to UAMS. We just got to get to 24 weeks. We just got to get to 24 weeks. Every time I mentioned being really sick, everybody was like, oh, that's so normal. That's normal. And, um, and uh, you know, I remember calling the clinic and talking to a nurse, and she was just so condescending. She was like, oh, honey, you know, everybody experiences that. You're going to be fine. I was like... I was like, I can't stop vomiting. I can't keep any food down. I, I can't keep water down. And she was like, well, you should eat some crackers. <laughs> I didn't really have a support system. And the few people that I knew or saw were just so excited about the fact that I was pregnant. <laughs> so I, um, I just got, was sicker and sicker and sicker. And it was just, nobody really noticed how sick I was. I don't know, probably around 11 or 12 weeks uh, um, toward the end of my first trimester, and I had lost like 15 pounds in just a few a couple weeks. 
and um, the nurse didn't even seem to notice and they scheduled me to have my gallbladder removed at the very beginning of my first trim or second trimester. I didn't heal from the surgery very well and I got a bad infection. I mean, I still have horrible scars from the infection and um, you know, I was like borderline septic. You know, and even then, like the surgeon had been, you're going to be feeling fine. You're going to be eating French fries. And, you know, like I was so dehydrated. They had trouble finding a vein. Um, my muscles all atrophied. I lost a ton of weight. The physical effects of my pregnancy are still with me. The last ultrasound visit that I had um, with her, I remember seeing her little body on the monitor and she was sucking her thumb and she was just kind of wiggling and the water was literally just sitting on her head. And like at that moment, I kind of just, I felt like I knew what was gonna happen. The week before Christmas, um, I started having contractions and I went to the hospital and they put me on the monitor, but they didn't want to hospitalize me because I was not to that viability age yet. Well, we're just, we're just going to have to see what's going to happen. We're just going to have to, and I was just like, what are we waiting for? Like, we clearly know what's coming. We know what's going to happen. Can we at least just get me somewhere so that she can have a chance, so that I can have a chance to be her mama? And I remember putting my hand on my stomach and I was like, baby girl, Baby girl, you gotta hang on. Just please hang on. I just, it was like, it's, it felt like a life, like being pulled, like I could feel like a pull away from me. And I just, I remember crying myself to sleep. And that next morning when I got up, I remember telling my grandma, and I was like, something just does not feel right. It just feels like something's there. And my daughter's head's out when I go to the bathroom. I screamed for my grandma and my mom. My mom was like, she got down and she looked at me and she said, you gotta push her out. And I was just like, okay. And she was like, just look at me, just focus on me and just push. And so I did. And um, she came out and my mom got her up and <laughs> wrapped her in a little towel for me. And I remember just looking at her and she was the prettiest little just she was beautiful and she just looked like she was sleeping and um I remember holding her all the way to the hospital and I remember I started to kind of go in and out just kind of lightheaded dizzy kind of in and out and I remember the funeral home director and I remember him taking Amani and um That was the most cold feeling, was to see him walk away with my baby. And I remember my body just kind of, everything kind of stopped and slowed down. The doctor came in and he said, we gotta get that placenta out. And I'm like, okay. So he just ma lightly massaged my belly and <clears throat> it came out, it was intact. I think the heartbreaking part was that my placenta was perfect. There was nothing wrong with it. And it's just, what can you, I don't even have the words because I'm like, my baby suffered and I was begging for help, begging them to help me. And it was just like, they didn't care. What we see in the state of Arkansas is a maternal health care crisis. And I often say, that every single person that touches maternal health care is responsible for the crisis that we are in. There is no entity, no skill set, no service, no profession that can say, well, we're doing all that we can. Actually, we're not doing all that we can because women are still dying. And if they're not dying, they're having um, morbidities, right? Um, near death experiences. Some of the things that are happening to these women. Um, big picture, they're not being heard. They're not being listened to. What they're saying is being dismissed. Um, pains are being dismissed. Aches are being dismissed. 
those are just some of the instances that, you know, women are dealing with just a little scratch of the surface. Um, and it's a lot and it's a heavy burden for those moms. We've had women who've had birth experiences that, that were horrible. And uh, we even have a few women that don't even want to talk about their birth experiences because um, they felt like they were close to death in some instances and weren't really treated with the respect that they feel like they were courted to or, sh or deserve. In my seventh month, I had a horrific experience in the emergency room. Um, I was telling the, the doctor at the emergency room that it had to be my kidneys and the pain was so intense and you know all he cared about was making sure I wasn't in labor. It's hard to explain the toll that it took on me because it so much of it showed up afterwards in you know my health just deteriorated a lot and that includes you know I lost a lot of teeth because of you know that's what happens when you have a baby. If you don't have enough nutrients, you know, it comes from your bones, it comes from your teeth. And I, there's a lot of stuff that my mental health is really hard to describe because I was neglected um, and I was ill and like too weak to care for myself, like basic care. I was vomiting like four times a day. Um, and that's just from water. I just, I don't know how I survived any of it, but you know, I was left alone on my own almost all the time, day, sometimes at night. And um, I just kind of mentally checked out. Um, I got to the point where I, like, I was only trying to keep myself alive because I had a baby. And um, it would have been a relief to die. I can't describe the sheer misery and loneliness <laughs> and feeling of utter abandonment. And that feeling has never really gone away. It passes and I don't think about it and yet it still affects me. I think I think my friend at Eugenio Maternity Network said it best once when she talked about hot trash on the side of the road, where women don't feel like they're respected, that they're treated uh, with kindness, or even that their uh, voice matters when they are providing, getting support in our healthcare system. This is a national crisis. Um, maternal rates, not just in Arkansas, but across the country are increasing. You can't just turn a blind eye to it. You can't turn your back to it. We, everybody has to work together. Arkansas is about 60% a maternal health care desert where there's no hospital or prenatal care available in that community. And the majority of those areas of the state, um, of those counties, um, Black families are there. And so it's huge. And so women are looked at differently based on their geographical location, like where they live, or based on the color of their skin, or maybe their potential, their partner situation. And so any Black mother trying to figure out, like, I'm hearing these statistics, I'm hearing this information, and I feel like I'm beating, I'm being beat down, and I feel like this circumstance is hopeless, and I feel powerless to change. It's important that we consider this maternity crisis that we have uh, confronting us as not just a healthcare crisis, but a social crisis. Having the challenge of jobs that don't pay living wages and having to figure out how they're going to support themselves and their child. How can I take off work to go to my prenatal appointments if they're gonna dock me pay for leaving my job? How am I gonna take off to, for maternity leave to take care of my baby if my, uh, the place where I work won't allow me uh, an adequate time to do that? It's multi-layered um, what's going on and the community has responsibility to be mindful because other lives are involved. I think this is a ha all hands on deck situation we're in right now. And all of us need to work together to make sure people have a full range of support and systems available to them to make sure we have good outcomes. Other countries have done this. We have the capacity to do this in America as well. The support aspect is crucial. Ujima is a Swahili word, and it means collective work and responsibility, making the problems of my brother and sister my own and solving them together. Black, white, and otherwise, we have a responsibility.
and that's all of us, but we have to work collectively and collaboratively. Every single person has responsibility and a unique skill set that they bring to the table that can be a part of the solution. One of the things I think is important for all of us is to educate ourselves, to become more familiar with what the needs are in our local communities, and then to become advocates on behalf of women and children in our communities that need additional supports to have healthy outcomes. Some of us have been very blessed to have good lifestyles, great opportunities, great families, great support systems. Unfortunately, there are still many people that don't have those things. And those are the people, those are the people that I think need us the most. Every second Saturday of the month, Ujima Maternity Network holds a maternal care community outreach. It is the opportunity for women that are expecting at any point in their pregnancy, no matter where they're birthing, to come and experience culturally congruent care with either a midwife, um, a doula, or even a lactation counselor. So it's a great opportunity for them to just kind of get their I's dotted, their T's crossed, but then there's just this cultural congruent care that is provided that you don't have to think about, do they understand my struggle? Do they understand my pain? Can, do I have to explain um, this, that, or the other? I don't have to do that. Like my, my guard is let down and these people care about me because at the end of the day, they are me. The Arkansas Birthing Project is a mentoring program which trains local community volunteers to provide support to women during their pregnancy and for the first year of life of their babies. We uh, link local community women who want a extra support person in their lives with a sister friend who's willing to provide that support. And that involves uh, just being a resource person for that individual, uh, providing them with connections to social supports and other needs that they might have during that really important period. They might need, for example, a car seat or a baby bed, a safe place for their babies to sleep. Some women need assistance with finding a place to live, uh, their couch surfing, uh, sometimes access to food and other resources that they might need. Have somebody that can be their eyes, ears, and nose when they, for many reasons, aren't able to be as fully effective in advocating for themselves as they could be. Uh, when someone else is present, a woman feels like uh, she's not by herself. And I think being alone during that time is a very scary place to be. Just being with women and celebrating them and sitting with them, educating them on their options, their resources, what's available to them, um, and empowering them so that they can have safe birth experiences in collaboration, in community. And our sister circle is... Ah, like that's the bread and butter of everything that we do is really creating and fostering a space of community where women can feel seen, they can be heard, they can be understood, they can express themselves and then learn about what's going on. Like what are the issues that exist in our state and how can we be an impactful um, part of the change, the positive change for that? It is, it is warm. It is relief. It is compassion, it is care, and it's powerful. That's what we need. We believe that by supporting women, we're supporting the diamonds in our community. You know, diamonds are created under pressure. And so we believe that the work that we do and the experiences that they have create better people. Long-term, we want women to plan for the future. We want women to plan for not only their own future, but the future of their children. When you have somebody that can get on your level, it makes a difference. It makes you feel like, oh, okay, you're a real person. You have emotions, you have feelings. You're not just going by the book and telling me what the book says. You're really trying to be empathetic and be here with me. When somebody can see how involved you are and, and that, that, that brings up that value, oh my gosh, they really do care about me. They're really concerned about my baby. They're really concerned about me. Okay, I can do this. It's empowering. So, yes, 100%. We're going to hold your hand. We're going to walk through this together. <laughs> a lot of people don't want to hear sad stories unless you have a happy ending. And, I mean, what's ending? 
I mean, death is the only end, right? So I'm alive and um, I have a child who is 20, almost 22, who I love dearly and fought so hard for and always have. And um, I'm proud of who I am. But, you know, I look at PTSD as not a success, but it's the best outcome because the only other outcome was death. I don't think, I don't think most people would have survived. I fought so hard to stay alive, so I keep living even when it's really hard. It didn't have to happen the way it happened. I mean, I could have had a better support network. I could have had people who listened to me and saw me. I, I could have had um, people who realized that just because you're happy, you have this happy thing, just because you're pregnant and you're going to have a baby doesn't mean that everything's good. Um, and that it's not just the life of the baby that matters. Um, like, I didn't want to lose my baby, but I didn't want to lose myself either. My husband and I have been married um, since 2018, June of 2018. Mav came along 2020, and here we are. He's our miracle baby. Amani, she watches over her little brother. I feel her every day. Amani's name means faith in Swahili. I was holding on to faith for her. Even though she's not with me physically, she's with me spiritually. I feel her every day. My experience with my OB when I was pregnant was with Maverick was completely, completely different. And I start smiling because I just love my doctor. Just the small calls, I, she would call me. She would text me. Hey, I'm just checking on you. How's our boy doing? How are you doing? And it was always, she put the decision in my hand after I was properly informed about all of my options. We are gonna do what's gonna work for, for you. To build up new moms like that, you know, it's just, it helps your confidence level with you got this brand new little bitty thing that's relying on you for everything and just, they just, they just poured into me. My husband poured into me and He's just amazing. Everybody was just amazing. Like this experience, it was like night and day. I felt like I mattered. And that's how we need to make all moms feel. If we have enough people to get out there and fight for these moms and show them that their lives are worth it, their children's lives are worth it, that there are people who really care. Let's have conversations and let's get a plan in place because you're gonna be more successful and women are gonna be more healthier and have healthier pregnancies and that makes a difference. It would make a huge difference. We can do it. Change can happen. <laughs>